If you're here to get help with your problem solve water tank, or you just want to learn more about your tank and that crazy ecosystem that you decided to keep in your house, you're in the right place because it is Sunday night. And special treat this week, we have a guest speaker. It's not just me the whole time. I actually get to share the mic and share the webcam, uh, share the stage with someone uh, very knowledgeable and someone to have a quite a good long history with. As uh, back in the day, that's 2011, Doc. I know we all used to look that young, uh, but we don't now. When I first started Mr. Saltwater Tank TV, um, I was in the need of cash. I pretty much had nothing. And someone recommended that I call Dr. Tim. They said, hey, he knows his stuff. You should talk to him about doing a show. And I said, all right. So I gave the guy a call and we chatted and he was one of the first quote unquote sponsored shows on Mr. Saltwater Tank TV, which was a lot of success, a lot of fun for both of us. Uh, and I learned a heck of a lot then and along the way. Dr. Tim is someone who's uh, very well respected in the public aquarium aquaculture space. He's written, written many peer reviewed papers about bacteria and that's fine bacteria, the whole gamut. Um, and as well as he runs Dr. Tim's Aquatics, home of lots of products that I use on my tank and my clients' tanks. Uh, the big one, the, the forerunner there is Dr. Tim's one and only Nitrofine Bacteria, as that's what I use to kickstart all my clients' tanks, pretty much instantly cycle my tank. So when Dr. Tim talks, I listen, and I'm excited that he's here with us uh, tonight. I'm going to turn it over to him for just a second. Uh, Dr. Tim, are you with us? I am, Mark. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for being with us on a Sunday evening. No problem. And I do have my uh, special limited edition, Mark Callahan, Martini Charter. Awesome. I dig it. I dig it. That's, uh, I saw that shirt. So a little backstory on this. Let's feel, feel everyone in on the inside joke. Dr. Tim is uh, very much a martini guy. I think he was James Bond in a second life, maybe a first life, but uh, that's beside the point. So he's very much a martini guy and Glenn's Tees, where I get all my crazy t-shirts. They had a shake and stirred vending machine for martinis, and I thought this is right up to right up Dr. Tim's um, alley, so I picked that up for him. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for being with us tonight, Dr. Tim. Anything that I missed on the introduction that everyone needs to know about you? Uh, I actually have fish aquariums and ponds, so I, uh, I don't just sell make stuff. I have aquariums, I have ponds, and I'm uh, always been a hobbyist since I was a kid, so I practice what I preach. And I've made awesome. lots and lots of mistakes. <laughs> well, as long as you learn from them, then uh, it's worth doing. And we're here to share our experience, our knowledge, what mistakes that we've made, as well as what we know to help you are all with your tanks uh, in one of those most pesky things uh, in the saltwater aquarium hobby, which is algae. Now, before we really go down the algae route, let's keep things in mind. Algae can be good. Perfusiums, this is something that's had a resurgence in the hobby in the past oh, five-ish years. Growing algae in a refugium in a controlled setting is good stuff. Like a lot of you look at this and you're like, I can use some of that for my refugium right now. True story, I have a client in New York City, and he told me that a hand-sized ball of Chato up there will sell for about 100 bucks because no one can get their hands on any and it's such demand. So if you need some cash, uh, you might consider going to New York and selling off some Shado. People might ask what you're doing, but if they're an Aquarius, they're going to know. So algae isn't all bad. I mean, it does. It has a bad rep, uh, but it's, it can be good in your refugium. It's good in your corals, because remember, that's a symbiotic relationship with algae. If you're looking at this and you're thinking that's not very pretty, freshwater tanks are for you. And let's face it, sometimes it doesn't look so good. This is not a good type of algae. This is not necessarily the thing that you're after. And some of you are looking at that and saying, that's simply my worst nightmare. If my tank looked like this, I would quit or pull my hair out or enter some kind of state of deep depression. If that's you, don't go there. It's not worth it. We're here to help you with your tank. If your tank looks like that or it looks worse, send us a picture because we'd love to get some befores and then help you through it. Yeah, we can see that. After. Is that your yeah. tank, Dr. Tim? No, that's my old, my tank before I learned what I was doing. Oh, okay. Well, hey, again, you've made the mistake. We're here to share our experience. Speaking of experiences, one thing, true story that happened to me, I had a client uh, actually in Tennessee here, his tank that I service, 
And he called me one day and he said, you got to get over here. Massive algae outbreak. The thing's about to crash. Well, what happened? I was there Friday. Now you're calling me on Monday. All right, I'll come right over. So I go booking over to his house. I walk in, I have a look at the tank, and he shows me that. And I said, this? And he said, yeah, that. Massive algae outbreak. This whole thing's going to crash. To which you have to kind of not laugh at that point. And first, because that's not algae. That's actually cyanobacteria. If you have that in your tank, we'll get to that in a minute. But this to him was considered massive algae outbreak. So this is relevant wherever you are in the scale of any amount of algae in your tank or cyanide was bad to full-blown nastiness out of control. This tank uh, can be saved. This is actually a tank that I recovered back in my Austin, Texas days, those of you that have followed me for a while. But the point is anywhere along the scale of horrible to, yeah, that's not real bad to, you know what? I just really want my tank to look like this. This is the end game. Pretty fish, pretty coral. Not a lick of, let's say, nuisance algae in that tank. This is what we want. So, as I said earlier, there's some good types of algae. Here's a movie from uh, Dr. Tim's era. I don't think I was allowed to see this one, uh, but that's good, fellas. For those of you that have been around long enough, you know what this is about. So there's good algae. It's very likely going to reside in your refugium for the most part. And it can also be algae that you feed your fish. You do feed our fish, or you should be feeding your fish nori. So that's another type of algae. So good types of algae you're going to have in your refugium. Uh, Chato, Chatomorpha, Cato, however you pronounce it. Everyone seems to have their own spin on that. Uh, the red stuff in the bottom is Gracilara, something that I feed my fish occasionally, and uh, they seem to lose interest in it after about three bites, but some fish eat it up. We also have great Calerpa. Is that still illegal in California, Dr. Tim? Can you not import that stuff? Yeah, there's seven species that are illegal still. Seven. seven. Okay. So yeah. this is something that uh, some quarters say it has a bad rap. They say it can go sexual and crash your tank, which I've had to go sexual, not a problem. I grow this in clients' uh, refugiums. This is great Calerpa. Not a problem. Love the stuff. Grows really well. And it looks kind of cool too. It almost looks like grapes uh, for those of you that are wine people. So we have good algae. Again, we have Nanori, the sheet algae that you should feed your fish more for your money. I recommend mixing up the colors, brown, red, green. Give your fish from variety. So we have good algae, which really is news, used for nutrient export. That's really why you have good algae in your tank. Growing in a refugium, you grow the algae, it sucks up nutrients, then you harvest that algae, you give it away or you throw it away, and that amount of nutrients is out of your tank. Now, if you're taking the algae out of your refugium and you're feeding it to your fish, you're not exporting any nutrients, you're simply just recycling things. But uh, you can also use algae for nutrient import. That's the fish food that we talked about. And then there's some really cool kind of ornamental algaes for those that have a refugium that's meant to be more than just nutrient export. It's also there to be uh, something to look at. There's all different types of ornamentals out there. Um, some really cool stuff, stuff that you don't see. Some of the stuff, the brown stuff up in the upper left, you maybe see that at the beach. Um, I've certainly seen that around um, Olva here. Again, there's all different kinds of cool ornamentals. So if you have a refugium and you have space to do more than just the Chato or the Calerpa for nutrient export, there's some cool ones in here that really do some neat stuff. And there's that type of algae, coralline algae, which hobbyists either love or they hate. I've had people that will absolutely spend hours on the weekend scraping down any kind of coralline algae in their tank. And then there are people like me that see it and go, oh, great, coralline algae showing up, awesome, go do your thing. Love it or hate it, it's another type of algae that's in your tank. And now let's switch gears and go to the dark side. The stuff that you see in your tank, and when you do, you freak out and you hope that it doesn't get out of control because it's the last thing that you want to see. Anywhere from diatom looking algae, the brown fuzzy stuff that just won't seem to go away, to bubble algae, which really isn't that bad. I've had it in plenty of tanks and don't really fear it. Uh, turf algae or um, and then Baropsis, that's another type of nuisance, uh, green kind of turfish algae, stuff that we don't like to see in our tank. So if you're seeing this stuff on the screen, you're like, that's me, you're in the right place. I'm going to talk to you, Dr. Tim and I are talk to you about what to do about it and why it's showing up in your tank, even when your test kits all read zero. So, and then there's this cotton candy pom-pom type algae as well. 
uh, that can show up in your tank to the stuff that's not even an algae. This is cyanobacteria. A lot of people say it's red slime algae. It is a bacteria. Uh, this is an algae talk, but cyano is very often confused as a nuisance algae. It is a nuisance in your tank, so we're going to talk about it um, as well. So that being said, again, this is no matter what type of algae you have in your tank, or hopefully not you, but multiple types of algae, it makes your tank look like it. And then what happens is your spouse goes and looks at your tank, especially when their mother-in-law is over and goes, that fish tank that's in your house, that always looks ugly, blah, 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 blah. You know where this is going. Now, the other side of this is your friends come over and they see all that green hair algae in the tank and they go, wow, that's really cool. It's moving. I like that. And you're just going, oh, no, no. Okay, fine. Smile. So we have to understand algae, where it comes from, what does it do, how does it live, and how does it grow? pretty simple in a way. It needs light, it needs carbon dioxide, and it needs water, and then carbohydrates, and as it grows, it lets out oxygen. So these are all things that algae needs to go do its thing, like carbon uh, in the form of carbohydrates, as well as other things, nitrogen and phosphates, those things that you've likely heard a lot about. What are your nitrate levels? What are your phosphate levels? Things that you already have in your tank. Or even if you think that you don't have them because your test kits are zero, and we'll talk about that in a minute, they're still there. So light's pretty easy. You've got lights over your tank, even if it's a fish only tank, because you wanna see what's in your tank. A fish tank that is dark is not much fun. I don't know why you would want that. No one wants a dark fish tank. So you're gonna have light. You simply can't get away from that. And there's a lot of carbon already in your tank in various forms. CO2, you've got fish, they expel CO2, boom, you at least have some carbon in your system. So it's there, you really can't get around that. And of course you have nitrogen in lots of different forms uh, in your tank as well. It's all here. And then you have that thing called phosphate. Now phosphates is something that uh, I laugh about, Dr. Tim and I laugh about it as well, because we've seen the gamut on phosphates from everyone wants zero, like I've talked about earlier in this webinar series, to now we need some phosphates. Uh, in the end, people are really just phosphate crazy. Either we don't want them, or I need some, or oh my gosh, I'm putting phosphates in my tank. I need to filter my RODI water because I'm going to ruin my tank because I'm putting in a tiny little bit of phosphate. Uh, this is something that I kind of get a kick out of because there's different types of phosphates. The soluble reactive phosphates, also known as SRP, this is the stuff that dissolves in your tank's water. And it's used by algae. Here's the kicker with these, the SRPs, that's the phosphates you can actually measure. So when you run your phosphate test, you're getting an SRP reading of SRP phosphates. Okay, those are the ones you can actually test for. I guess I recommend you test your tank. Here's the maybe potentially bad news. According to Dr. Tim, SRP accounts for less than 2% of the total phosphate in your tank. So when you go run a phosphate test, you're testing for less than 2% of the total phosphates that are there. That's not necessarily bad. I'm not saying don't test your tank, just know you're testing for just a little bit. Okay, so there's another big type of phosphates, and this is something that Dr. Tim taught me years ago that made a lot of sense and really opened up a lot when I started dealing with algae and clients' tanks, uh, back when I used to consult on tanks. There's a whole bunch of organic phosphates, and these are phosphates that are trapped in organic matter. Okay, it's in there, it's locked away, and uh, the thing is, algae can't touch that stuff it's locked away, but bacteria can. Bacteria love it. They can actually tear apart organic molecules and get down into the phosphate, and most algae can't perform luxury consumption. And with that, I'll let Dr. Tim take over for just a second to teach us about luxury consumption. So what luxury consumption is, it's basically the ability of bacteria to eat more than they need right now. And that's actually how bio pellets are made. Bacteria are fed to excess, and they basically luxury consume because they are in, in evolutionarily programmed to know that times are going to be bad, and they basically get fat. And they store these nutrients. So there's a potential way to help battle your algae is by using bacteria to outcompete the algae because they'll consume more than they need 
limiting the of, uh, nutrients available to algae. And we're going to talk about how you unintentionally mess up this cycle in your aquarium and uh, give you some fixes. Because really, the bacteria are the key to the whole system and their ability to consume nutrients much faster and much in much greater quantities than algae is how you fix most of these problems we're going to talk about tonight. Awesome. So now phosphates come in, in a bunch of different ways. It's food, water, if you're not using non-RBI water, uh, tap water, for example, coral food, detritus breaking down in your tank. It can also be stuck in rocks, dirty rocks, um, which I'll talk about in an upcoming series over at saltwateraquarium.com. Uh, it comes in in a bunch of different ways. Now, phosphates are also, in my opinion, the easiest to control. They're not that hard to really get under control, yet living organisms in your tank, including your fish and you actually, need phosphates. You got to have them. So you don't want to absolutely get rid of them because then life stops. So, yeah, don't, sorry, Mark, don't, don't believe, people say, why can't you make a fish food that's phosphate free? That's like making a gasoline with no octane. You have to have phosphate. It's the energy that fuels our cells, all the animal cells. So don't believe some hype of a fish food that says they're phosphate free. That's basically then start a cardboard or something like that. You gotta have right. it bone, snake oil. All right. So here's the thing about curing algae outbreaks. A lot of times we think. I have an algae outbreak, I'm gonna do one thing and everything's gonna be cured, done. Let's face it, but we're Americans, we like easy and we like fast and it probably should be cheap too. Let's just throw that in there because why not, right? That's what we think. In reality, when you go to deal with a nuisance algae outbreak, you do one thing, you do probably multiple things, then you have to add in the element of time then you get to where you're going. Now, they're quick fixes, but to really get around this thing to do it right, as Dr. Tim and I were talking about, it's a combo of things. You have to do things right, and you have to do this for a period of time. So if you're dealing with a nuisance algae outbreak, hang in there, get committed, because they can get better, but don't expect results immediately. Just keep this in mind. Now, if you have an algae problem, mostly you have a nutrient problem. But people are going to look at this and say, why do I have this popping up in my tank when my test kits are all registering zero? Now, this is a fun one that Dr. Tim and I like to go back and forth about. So I'm going to let him talk about you for a minute. Why, if you have a nuisance algae outbreak, do your test kits all register zero? Well, the problem is you're not measuring what the source is. When, when we talk about holistic or ecology of a, you know, a system, your tank has sources and it has sinks. And as Mark was talking about with phosphate, you're only measuring the soluble reactive phosphate, but it's a very sticky molecule. So it's sticking to everything that has to, that becomes a source as it's broken down, like the organics or the rocks or things like that. So you, you can have tons of phosphate in the water. The only way to measure that would be a digestion doing a total phosphate. Same with nitrogen. You, there's different forms. Nitrate, ammonia, and nitrite are inorganic forms of nitrogen. There's a bunch of organic nitrogen too. And there's no test out there for measuring the organics in your system. And even if you could measure the, well, there is, it's called a total organic analyzer, and they're about $45,000. Um, but you, you've got all these sources that you're not measuring that are adding to the system. And as soon as they get into the water, your nuisance organisms grab them. That's what people say, you know, I've got no nitrate. I've got tons of cyano. You have nitrate. It's in the cyano. That's why we're using, if you're going to go back and Mark's talking about the refugia, unless you harvest that refugia, it's all going to recycle. You've got to get that algae, the calerpa, out of the system so that it doesn't all recycle. So what do we do about a nuisance algae outbreak? Some people just say, I'm going to add a bunch of fish. Now, this works for some nuisance algae types. Herbivores, you say, I'm going to add some yellow tangs. They're going to eat up my green hair algae, and anything's going to be cured. Some people will put a C here in there, uh, which has its own risks about going toxic. 
You can also put in urchins, one of my favorite organisms, speaking out, uh, in my saltwater aquarium, in my client tanks, hermit crabs. These are all things that people say that you can do uh, to deal with an algae outbreak. And different types of organisms like emerald crabs that have a lot of success targeting things like bubble algae. It can work. Now, as I said earlier, we're Americans. We want fast and quick, fast, cheap, and easy. So then it comes along the turbo estrella or Mexican turbo snail. Those guys can plow down algae. They can get that done. However, doing all these things is simply a reactive step. You're going, I have a problem. I'm going to just let these things eat the problem, eat the byproduct of the problem, not actually get to the bottom of why there is a problem which isn't bad, that's one way to run your tank. I don't recommend it, I don't think Dr. Tim would either, but you can do that. And then you can do things like refugiums, which suck up uh, nutrients in your tank. And really, they are a viable export method. My key little uh, footnote on that is, if it's large, if you've followed me for a long time, you've always heard me say that refugiums can work, but don't expect much horsepower out of them if they're small. Imagine taking this outboard motor and strapping it to that thing and then wondering why you're not going anywhere. It's the same thing. You put this little refugium, then a little section of your sump, maybe you have a separate refugium, but it's not that big, on your bigger tank, even in like a 75 gallon tank, a small refugium isn't gonna do that much. So you have to have your expectations in check. You're not gonna cure your algae outbreak by packing that little thing onto your tank. I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying keep your expectations in check. So the small ones can work if your bio load is small. But the key to this is, as Dr. Tim says, you have to keep your expectations in check. And more importantly, you have to get those nutrients out of it. Now you may just want a refugium for looks, which is okay. But the cure to this is, the key is, you gotta get the nutrients out of there. You gotta improve your water quality. Using a refugium to export nutrients is one way to do it. You can also use RRDI water. You can do things like feed your fish less, bump up your water changes, add higher quality fish food, change up your aquascaping if you got a bunch of nutrients traps in there, detritus sinks. All that can go on. Stop feeding your corals. I'm personally not a, a feeding coral fan. There's a footnote to that, which I'll get to in a bit. Also getting better equipment is a ways to deal with nuisance algae outbreaks to try to get your nutrients under control. Adding some things to your tank, such as GFO. This is a GFO, which is best run in a media reactor. That is there to absorb phosphates. However, remember, it's only absorbing the SRPs. And it only absorbs what it contacts. If you don't get the right amount of water flow to it, or if the water that has phosphates in it never come in contact with it, it's not going to go anywhere. But as Dr. Tim talked about earlier, remember that bacteria, certain types of bacteria, can break down organic matter to grab those organic phosphates, something that algae can't do. This is uh, mainly done with uh, carbon dosing, whether it's a liquid carbon dose or a bio pellet uh, carbon dose. Dr. Tim makes a bio pellet product, uh, the pearls, which I've used on clients' tanks and have had a lot of success with. So I wanna go into carbon dosing for just a minute because it's something that I like when your tank needs it. And it's a great way to deal with nuisance algae outbreaks because as we talked about earlier, bacteria are really good about eating up nutrients. They can tear apart organic molecules to get it. And even they can go make themselves fat so they can be ready, something that algae can't do. So bacteria gets introduced to your system to outcompete algae for nutrients. This is why if you start dosing carbon dosing products, even products that are hiding, disguising themselves as a carbon dose, you see nuisance algae goes away and then you also see your refugium disappear. Uh, your refugium may crash out and may simply wither away or drop in numbers, uh, drop in volume because the bacteria is getting to those nutrients first. It's grabbing them. It's tearing apart molecules to get to them. It's simply better at what it does. Uh, I love using bacteria um, as a great way to deal with nuisance algae outbreaks because it's simply far more efficient at processing uh, nutrients uh, than algae really ever is. So, that being said, let's talk about the big nuisance algae outbreaks, the usual suspects, uh, another one of my favorite movies, um, 
that you're likely going to see in your tank. Let's talk about them, let's understand them, and then let's talk about how to deal with them because you're not just here to learn about them. You want to know what to do with it if you have these. And by the way, I've dealt with all these in my tanks. If you're dealing with them, don't feel like you're alone. I've been through it too. I'm willing to bet Dr. Tim has seen these all as well. All right, all the time. Our most common question after cycling. Cyanobacteria, not an algae, but we're lumping it in here. GHA, green hair algae, and then dinos, dinoflagellates. It's not an algae, but again, we're just lumping these together because people think um, that they are algae. Really, it all comes down to nitrates, phosphates, nutrients, and, hate to be the deal breaker on this one, you. Ultimately, you're the Aquarius. How do you run the tank? How do you deal with it? Or put your head in the sand and not deal with it. But let's break this down. Let's understand why these things happen to begin with. If you have a nuisance algae outbreak in your tank, largely your nitrate phosphates are out of whack. For example, high phosphates and you have high nitrates, this is party time for algae. It's got nutrients, it's got light, it's got everything it needs and it just goes crazy. You've got GHA in your tank, green hair algae everywhere, the stuff that your friends think are cool because it's moving and you're just hiding your head shaking. How does your beautiful saltwater tank get overrun with this stuff this quickly? And if you have high phosphates and you have low or no, that's under five parts per million nitrates, then you see those cyanobacteria outbreaks. And the big pesky one, which has really come on everyone's radar in the past three years, you got low phosphates, under 0.05 parts per million, low nitrates, that's under five again, especially if you're down around zero parts per million on nitrates, then we get these dinoflagellates. This is where we really go crazy because you're like, my water is clean and I've got this junky, bubbly looking stuff growing all over my tank. So let's break these down into each of them in each case. So, because I've seen people deal with all of them, I'm sure Dr. Tim gets all these questions very frequently. So, you have high nitrates, you have high phosphates. Your tank and the algae inside says, thank you, it goes bazonkers and it starts growing. This is a nutrient field with lots of light, algae just goes nuts, it seems to come out of nowhere. How do you deal with this? Now, you can reduce the nutrients, there's lots of ways to do that. Adding a phosphate absorbing media, using better fish food, drop feeding your, uh, drop the coral food. I can say drop feeding your corals because Dr. Tim has a coral food that he likes that actually I like as well. Drop the coral food. You can take less fish to remove fish out of your tank, get better gear, etc. These are all things. The other key to this is you have to be patient with green hair algae in this process. If you do these things, especially like adding phosphate and dormant media on Monday, don't expect your GHA problem to be gone by Wednesday. It takes time and it takes the commitment. You can't just do it once and then go back to trash in your tank and then you're gonna have and think that you're home free because those things will come back again. So you gotta do it right and you gotta be patient with it. Green algae is actually a pretty easy one to cure. Get your nutrients right, then you just have to wait it out. You have to starve it out, eventually it will go away. It's not going to disappear overnight. It's going to take some time. But when you start to see it disappear, that's when you start smiling. You're actually beating this thing that seems to come out of nowhere. Any words about GHA, Dr. Tim, before I move on? Well, another thing you can do, and, and it's kind of the uh, mantra I have, is don't don't run your skimmer. Or you know, everybody wants if you got a hundred gallon tank, you're going to get a five hundred gallon skimmer. Because where's the bacteria in this? Well, unfortunately, you're removing the bacteria because the skimmer is super efficient at removing bacteria. So you're running that skimmer 724. You're unintentionally removing what you need, which is the bacteria in the system. So consider running that skimmer only 20 hours a day. Turn it off just for a while. You don't have to skim 24 hours a day. That allows the bacteria to consume the nutrients. You turn the skimmer back on and remove those bacteria and you just use that cycle. And, and you'll see great success by not over skimming. And this is true, Dr. Tim, even if you're not carbon dosing, which is spurring the growth of bacteria to eat up the nutrients and then export them, there's some amount of new bacteria in your tank that's gonna be doing that job 
even if you're not carbon dosing. So then cycling your skimmer can be a good thing. Right. E yes, definitely. And the other thing is, if is check your lighting because a lot of people get the you know nice new lights and they run that blue spectrum at a hundred percent you don't necessarily need to do that especially if your tank isn't deep and that's why you check in with why the par meter is so important but if you just can't figure that algae out are you running your blue lights at a hundred percent in a tank that's only 12 18 inches deep dial that back because they love that you're you're just putting them on steroids with that light if you remember mark's earlier slide so you do not have to run that blue channel at 100 percent in these shallow tanks especially with these new lighting systems which are great they're but they're just super powerful and i see a lot of people over light tanks in a way i can't blame them i mean you get the nice blues going on the world blues it makes your corals for us you know like this is great let's crank it up you can be hurting things in the long run. All right, so now we have high phosphates. We have seemingly low or no nitrates. This is a system that's nitrogen limited for algae um, as there's really not much in the water. And when that happens, you get this stuff that comes to seemingly come out of nowhere and grows really, really fast. This could be it in the morning, in the afternoon, it could seem to take over half of your tank. Now this one's a little tricky. Cyanobacteria has been around for, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, billions of years. It grows, of yeah, and it grows in the desert where there's no water. So then we put it in your tank where there's nutrients, there's a heck of a lot of water, there's lights, and it has a party. It goes bazonkers. And the thing to keep around with this, Dr. Tim was talking about earlier, was about bacteria uh, and nutrients, you know, balancing this type of thing. Dr. Tim has some bad bacteria, some bad news for you about Sino about fixing nitrogen from the air. So I'm going to let him. I'm going to turn it over to him about for a minute for about that. Well, I mean, I I go to a lot of shows and people come up to me and they'll say, you know, I got terrible Sino. I can't fix it. My water quality is perfect. I don't have any nit a nitrate. You know, zero. Fun fact. Cyanobacteria fix nitrogen from the air, and you're not going to eliminate any nitrogen from the air at 78% nitrogen. So that's where they have the upper hand. And by you taking your tank and getting super low nitrate, which some people do, they would say, I'm going to fix this because they need carbon, they need phosphorus, and they need nitrogen. I'll do low nitrate. You play right into the hands of the cyano. You can't grow algae because they need some nitrogen. And actually you can't grow the bacteria you want to fight all these guys because they need some nitrogen. And the cyano though, they fix the nitrogen from the uh, air. And so they're the only thing that grows. Get the nitrate back up and the cyano will go away. Which seems so counterintuitive because you're like, you're telling yeah. me to get the nitrates up when I had this outbreak. Yeah, yeah. but. It, it happens all the time. If somebody comes to me, you come to me and tell, and tell me what nuisance you have, and I can pretty much 99% of the time tell you what your water quality is. And I wish I could get those odds in Vegas when it reopens. But <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And then you can go throw it in the stock market and uh, keep your odds going. Yeah. All right. So that, that cyanobacteria, there's some things you can do in the short term. And this is something that I'd like to do if I'm battling it. First thing I like to do is suck out as much as I can. Simply remove it from your system. Get it out of the way. I understand it's going to come back a little bit, but go ahead and get rid of those organics. If you kill off the, the cyanobacteria, it's just going to dump all that back into your tank. So go ahead and take out all that you can. It usually comes off quite easy. You can bat your hand at it and suction it out. Is what I want to do. Or get half-inch tubing and just suck, touch it on the rocks, and it'll suck that stuff right out of the way. So go ahead and get it out of the system. Remove some big organics in your tank. This may be fish, this may be uh, dead, uh, low flow parts of your system, um, sponges, uh, mechanical filtration that needs to be cleaned up. Go ahead and clean that stuff. And then you hit it with one, two punch. This is something that I love to do with Cyano, which is dose the refresh and then dose the waste away. The two products from Dr. Tim, bacteria product. Uh, I'm gonna let you talk about those for just a minute, Dr. Tim, so we all know what they are and what they do. Right, so the, the idea and why Mark is saying 
clean up first is that it's a numbers game. Right now, the cyanobacteria is outnumbering everything else. So you got to put the odds in favor of the good guys. And that's why you clean out as much as you can, get rid of the organics because they can feed on those. And then the refresh is a bacteria that excretes a substance, the bacteria sin that I developed that kills the cyano but this is only treating a symptom. All you're doing is trying to knock the cyano out so it doesn't come back, so lower their numbers. And then the waste of ways, the key, because it gets rid of organics. It's the bacteria that get rid of particular organics and dissolved organics, which you have in your tank. You can't measure those, but you have them. And cyano is a pretty clear sign that you've got a lot of uh, organics in the system, especially if you've got any dead spots. I mean, there's this customer of a store that I deal with a lot, and he was telling me this customer just had sign all over the place on a custom-built aquarium. And I said, he's got a dead spot. No, no, he doesn't have a dead spot. I promise you, he's got a big reservoir that's a dead spot in there. Finally, the guy, is it's a huge aquarium, tore the whole thing down, and they got to a reservoir and it stunk like rotten eggs. They've got hydrogen sulfide, and that's a reservoir that's producing stuff that feeds the, or the cyanobacteria. So it's all about cleanliness and then using bacteria to wipe out the last vestiges of cyano. Cyano can be fixed. It's, it's harder than green algae, and it, as Mark has said many times, it took some time to get the problem. It's going to take some time to get rid of it. Don't think you're going to fix this in one day. Nothing good happens fast in your aquarium. You can just keep on the schedule and you can get rid of this. Now, there are products that knock out cyanobacteria very quickly. It's really nothing more than a medication. And you're treating the symptom, not the cure. And a lot of times when you do that, you get excited because you're like, sweet, it's gone. However, you've then just killed all that cyanobacteria. You just dumped all these nutrients back in your tank. It's not uncommon for it to come back very quickly. So there is a quick fix product out there, but I don't like to use it because it, the repeat or the relapse uh, episodes after it are usually quite high. We want to get these things. We want to make them go away. So longer term, what can you do? You can get your nitrates up. As Dr. Sinner, Dr. Tim said earlier, put some nutrients into the system. I know it seems counterintuitive, but now that you're understanding how these things play together, Hopefully you understand why you would want to do that. There's probably enough phosphate in your tank already. Even if you can't measure it, you probably don't have to worry about that. Um, but you can get your nitrates up a little bit to help you get rid of that cyanobacteria. And again, it's, it's a long-term, it can be a longer-term play, but it will go away. Uh, I've, I've had plenty of tanks, but I've never seen cyano in them ever. So it can happen if you're in the middle of a cyano outbreak, take this to bite the heart, I promise you it will go away. Now, yeah, let me let me jump yep. in if, if you don't mind real quick, because sure. a lot of people will try with the cyano to do the carbon dosing. But what you have to understand is if you've got a lot of cyano, they're going to take those nutrients that are in the carbon dosing themselves. So it'll just make the case worse. So you, if you're going to carbon dose to get rid of cyano, you really have to realize that you're going to be out there cleaning that cyano off every morning and every night to allow the bacteria that are in the water to start overtaking, becoming numerically superior to the cyano that's on the substrate, because they're going to grab those nutrients that are in the carbon dosing too. I mean, that sounds great, Dr. Sam. I think I'm going to fly to California and just, you know, let's just find some cyano tanks and every morning and afternoon just siphon <laughs> off some cyano. Sign me up. Yeah, sign me up. That's the cure for COVID is cyanobacteria. You never know, right? You, you uh, never know. It's a virus. It is. All right. So now this situation, which it's really come to, it's not like it's a new type of nuisance algae outbreak or something new in the tank, but all of a sudden we're more aware of it. So when you're more aware of it, it seems to pop up more. You have low nutrients, low phosphates, low nitrates, but you got this junky stuff, bubbly, stringy, nastiness stuff that can take over and kill corals, drives people crazy. Why would this ever show up? This is dinoflagella, it's also known as dinos. What do you do about this stuff? Because there are people that say you can't do anything about it. 
I battled it. I've tried everything. I'm about to throw in the towel. And then there are things that you can do. Simple thing to do is turn off your lights on your tank for three days. I know your tank is pretty. Dr. Chen talked earlier about those pretty blue lights, but turn all your lights off, not just the blues. Turn off your lights. Three days of darkness, black out the tank. Now, you can take this to whatever level you want. Some people wrap their tank if it gets a lot of na uh, natural light, wrap it in a blanket, make sure it doesn't overheat. Don't cover the top because you got to get some gas exchange. But you're basically just turning off the lights on this stuff. Think about it. Out on the reef and the ocean, it's not 100% sunny every single day with perfect lighting. There are days that it's cloudy. There are days where it's stormy. They get typhoons that knock out reefs. So three days of darkness isn't going to hurt your tank. It's not going to kill all your corals. It shouldn't kill any coral if you turn your lights off for three days. Now, here's the thing about three days of darkness. As a hobbyist, it's not much fun because your fish don't come out as much. You don't get to see those pretty corals, and you're like, oh, is it three days yet? If I ever have to do three days of darkness, which I haven't done in I don't remember how long, I would usually do it when I'm out of town so then I don't have to deal with looking at a dark tank. So do three days of darkness. Simply turn off your lights, all the lights on your tank, for three days. If you want to turn on your lights long enough to feed, do it quickly, but turn off your lights. Then hit your tank with the refresh first uh, and then the waste away because we have to clean up the system uh, and get rid of the organics. Even if you can't test it, you see low nitrates, low phosphates. We still need to get rid of that stuff, and that's what the bacteria does. The other thing you can do is raise your nutrients. This sounds crazy. The tank is nutrient poor, so put some nutrients into the thing. If you're using phosphate removing media, scale it back or turn it off. You can actually dose in some nitrates, make your nutrients go up. Another way to do that is simply feed your fish more. They're always going to eat. They're going to thank you for it. You can't add more fish if you have some ready to go, fully quarantined. And as I said a minute ago, pull out your GFO. Hey, here's good news. Stop doing your water change. This is permission not to do a water change. Don't do it. Get the nutrients uh, built up into your system. These, uh, these dinos will go away. You can cure them. You can lick them. You just have to go against what you're thinking, which is, I have a nutrient problem. In this case, you do, but it's a low nutrient problem. You want to put some nutrients into that system. So anything you want to add about dinos, Dr. Tim, before I go on? So you might be thinking, well, this doesn't make any sense. If I have these low nutrients, how come I'm getting dinos? Well, the thing about dinos is they're photosynthetic and they feed on organics. And you can't measure organics and you're putting tons of light into the system. And by having basically, I mean, I get emails every day, talk to people and they have the dino, send me the pictures and the first questions, I don't even, it's not even a question. I tell them your phosphate is zero and your nitrates below five. And they'll go, yep, how'd you know that? Because of those low values, you can't grow cyano, you can't grow green hair algae, and unfortunately, you can't grow water that's in the water column, would be bacteria that would be in the water column to fight these guys. So that you've unintentionally, maybe, by being super cleansy, I mean, we know those people, they're germaphobes, but here, you're trying to make your water gin clear. Gin's for martinis, not for your aquarium. I'm a martini expert. I know this, Obviously. and and this is the this is the issue. You and since these guys can photosynthesize or photosynthetic, and you've got organics, you've turned the system or right into their wheelhouse. You got to change it. Make some adjustments to the water quality. Get your nutrients up, and these guys will go away. We promise you, it will uh, go it away. Will. You, I, I've solved these. Got lots of emails. This will happen. You just have to have some patience and follow the schedule. Now, we talked about the big ones. And let's give you some uh, pointers here before we flip it over to the questions. By far, preventing an algae outbreak is way easier than ever curing an outbreak. We've made how to cure it pretty easy for tonight. We've given you some paint-by-number steps. But if you never have to deal with it, if you do the right things to prevent it, that's way better than ever trying to cure one. Curing an algae outbreak takes time and patience and commitment, as well as preventing one. It does too, but it takes less time, patience, and commitment to prevent it than it does to cure it. And keep in mind that it's a mix of reactionary and preventative steps. You want to prevent things, but if some of it is you're reacting. You have an algae outbreak, 
And again, we think it's going to be one thing that cures everything. Remember, it's usually a combination of things. If I can make a Venn diagram, there would be lots of things overlapping, as well as adding in the element of time. So prevent it. Absolutely. Do everything you can to prevent the thing. When you do have an algae outbreak, know you know what to do about it. And ultimately, it all comes down to you. You're the Aquarius. This is your slice of the ocean that you're maintaining. How you run the tank is reflected in how it looks. And sometimes things creep up on you seemingly out of nowhere. But now you know what to do. You know how to deal with the big algae outbreaks that are out there. We've given you the ammo to go deal with them. And with that, we're going to flip it over to questions. Remember, if you have a question, raise your hand. I will call on you. You can also type it in the text question there as well if you're shy and uh, you don't want to take your question to me or the doc. But you've got two people uh, to bounce your questions off of. Remember, let's keep it on topic for nuisance algae outbreaks first. Uh, and then we're going to flip it over. If we have any time left, we'll take some general questions. But let's go with the uh, algae relevant questions first. We'll start here in the middle of the alphabet. All right, Lee D, uh, you're on. Make sure you unmute yourself. Uh, put the screaming kids away in the background uh, and fire away, Lee. Uh, hi there, guys. Hey, how you uh, doing? Oops, hang on. He just muted himself. All right, Lee, try again. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right. All um, right. I'm in a hospital right now. I'm an actual respiratory therapist, so I'm I'm on a little break right now, <laughs> watching Thanks. you guys. <laughs> it worked. Take care of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You probably hear Aravin or something like that. But um, so my tank is doing well. I have a 125, and I got it established, and it's doing ten times better than what those people were doing with it whenever they got it. So um. I would say my parameters are good. Last time I tested my nitrates, it was what you guys were saying, probably five. And I haven't done a water change in a few weeks, but all my corals are happy. Everything's doing well, but I have a little bit of a cyano outbreak. It's not unmanageable. You know, I'm doing what you guys are saying. You know, I'm like with my feeder, I'm brushing it off. I'm like blowing it off and then sucking it out of the aquarium, trying to get rid of it. And I have been, I heard somebody else about dosing good bacteria to try and overcome that bad bacteria. So I've just been dosing Microbacter 7 and then kind of going along with my business with my feeding and stuff and everything. And I want to know what, what, what are some other suggestions as far as other than what you guys said. I mean, I'm going to let my nitrates grow up a little bit. Hopefully that uh, that will help. I do have a refugium, and the chato probably does need to be harvested a little bit because it's been growing. So, and I keep a light on it, but I try not to keep it on it all day. I have the Radeon XR15s, and I have supplemental T5 lighting that only stays on for four hours a day. So, okay, well, I. I would right away start putting your skimmer on a cycle and just uh, turn your skimmer off at night for two to three, four hours. Don't turn it off right at, you know, if you're dosing the a bacteria, but on days you're not dosing the bacteria, just let the skimmer turn off for two to four hours and keep that up. In a week, you'll start seeing uh, a big difference because that you're letting the, bac the bacteria in the water column uh, out compete the cyanobacteria. Well, it's weak. I, Dr. Tim turned me on to that years ago and I thought it was crazy. I'm like, you want me to what? Uh, but it actually, I use it in uh, tanks that are more nutrient poor. Uh, even two hours, as he said, works great. Again, as I've said throughout this webinar series, start slow. Don't go to 12 right off the bat. Start at two and see what you get. Uh, but it started to make a big difference, not only with nuisance algae, but also with the colors uh, of the coral and feeding the coral more by feeding them the bacteria that they eat. Uh, and it actually had a nice side effect as well. So uh, some, what, oh, sorry, ahead. Mark, stepping on you. the bacteria in the water are these heterotrophs multiply every 20 minutes. So only in a couple hours, you're going to have lots of bacteria. And as Mark 
mentioned, corals filter feed 24 hours a day. What does the coral in the ocean eat 24 seven? It eats bacteria because it's filter feeding the water. And what are we doing? We're putting skimmers on there and reducing the uh, bacteria in the water. And that's why your corals are turning brown. Rotifers are French fries to corals. They're not nutrition. And, and you, if you just do that, I promise you, because I've gotten lots of emails because I have a talk on this, I've given it wrap in a couple of places. And within 10 days, you will notice a difference by that simple fix. Just put your skimmer on a timer and turn it off two to four hours. You said French fries, Doc. I'm, I'm feeling like urge for a double double with animal style with some fries. I know um, what you mean. They never closed. They, their drive in window line was a half a mile long, but they were open. And we're talking in and out burgers, people. Hmm. Yeah, they, we don't have those around here, and I can't come visit you just yet to go do that. But uh, yeah, that now I'm hungry again. Thanks for the good advice and uh, making my stomach growl. All right, Lucas T. Uh, have at it, Lucas. You're on the air. Awesome. How you doing, Mark? This question is for Dr. Tim. I was uh, I use uh, Waste Away, and I was told by my LFS to not use a, a fuge, and so I haven't had a fuge on this tank for uh, six months. But I want a place for my uh, pods to live. Well, the, the the reason they would suggest not to use a refugia is they're both doing the same thing. So the the algae's. Uh, sucking up the nutrients and the bacteria are sucking up the nutrients. You can do both, but you're gonna to have to cut back on the dosing of the bacteria to allow some nutrients and for the refugia, you know, I assume you're gonna have calerp in there because that is then where the pods can grow and stuff like that. It's just gonna be a, a balancing act depending on how much you feed every day, but you can do it. Um, and you're just gonna to have to be careful because you don't want, your nutrient levels to drop so low that you get into one of these uh, problems with uh, you know, no nitrates and no phosphates or low of one or the other. So you're just going to have to dial it in a little bit, but you can do it. You can, you can do it at the same time. You know, true, uh, true story about this, Dr. Tim. I had a client tank here in town um, that I manage and it had a refugium on it. And even with the refugium, because they feed like stupid heavy. I can't believe how fast they blow through frozen food. Um, they had a refugium and we were running bio pellets and the best I could really get the nitrates down to was about five. And the, uh, the bio pellet reactor actually started leaking. So the bio pellets weren't getting much flow, which means bacteria growth slowed down. I had to take the bio pellet reactor off the system until I could get a replacement. And when I did that, the nitrates actually went from five and they dropped down to about two to three and the refugium absolutely blew up. So there is a balance there. Uh, speaking to what you were talking about, why they're having the, the you know, back off on one because it is going to outcompete. Um, you don't necessarily need a refugium for pods. This is something that uh, we sell over at saltwaterquarium.com. Um, a little place for the pods to hang out. I've seen them grow in uh, cryptic zones. You just put some live rock down in your and your sump, what was your refugium? If your refugium happens to die off, they'll grow and they'll be happy like this. Now, it is fun to have a refugium and you get those big amphipods in there amongst all the algae and you feel like it's an ant farm. Um, that was entertainment back in the day when Dr. Tim was growing up, but uh, it, it can work. So don't feel like if you don't have a refugium, you're not going to have any pods. Uh, but great question there. All right, Gideon M, let's turn it over to you, Gideon. You're unmuted. Fire away. Oh, you got to unmute yourself, Gideon, if you want to fire. All right, we will come back uh, to Gideon. Let's go to a text question here, uh, and then we'll drift back over to the uh, live question. So John says, Dr. Tim mentioned dead spots in the tank. Uh, can you elaborate on what you need to look for for dead spot? Also, what can we use to identify the algae outbreak that uh, we're dealing with? So the last part of your question, John, the slides we showed you are the big algae outbreaks you're likely going to see between green hair algae, hair algae, cyanobacteria outbreaks, and then dinos. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tim to talk about how you can see a dead spot in your tank. Well, you can't quote, you know, see the dead spot, but what you're going to do is if you have persistent nitrate problems, 
you're doing everything. Uh, and I'm not a, a fan of doing everything in terms of having a refugia and having bio pellets and, and adding bacteria and this, that, and the other thing. I much more prefer that depending on the size of your tank and the system, you pick one and dial one, one thing you're going to do and dial that in. Uh, I, I think it just is less work for you, makes things easier so you're not chasing your tail. Um, but if you're, you've got something in there and you're trying to control nutrients and you can't get rid of the nitrate, that's pretty clear case that you have a dead spot in your system. Uh, something that I look at uh, when I'm looking for a dead spot in a tank is low flow areas. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's immediately a, a dead spot or nutrient sink, but if I see a bunch of fish waste, fish poop piling up in that area, I know that that's a, a low flow, a, a problem area. There's other stuff that's probably going to pile up there too. Simply as moving your power heads around, turning up the flow, maybe adding more, can get that stuff up into the water column, into your filter socks, your sponges uh, into your skimmer to help get uh, rid of them. Uh, it's different than uh, back in the day of deep sand beds. I know you love deep sand beds, Dr. Tim. Uh, those there, if you like a time bomb in your tank. <laughs> I've seen them go off. It's not pretty. So Ed is uh, Ed's having a fun time with us. Our, your recommendation of turning off the skimmer, he says, so is turning off your skimmer for four hours a day better than completely taking off the skimmer to deal with GHA. Yeah, you, you don't want to, I'm not saying get rid of the skimmer, throw it out or anything like that, because you have to get rid of organics. And the skimmer, it's it's a, the efficient way, it's not a, a super efficient way, but it's one of the best ways we have to get organics out of the system. All I'm saying is turn it off for a few hours. And as we both said, you don't want to do anything quick and rash. So just a few hours, try it for one or two hours for a couple of days and then slowly increase it. Just don't go home and unplug it and let it sit there. That's not what we're saying. Just a few hours each day and see how your tank reacts. Give your tank a week, okay? observe. Your eyes are gonna tell you what's going on. You don't have to have test kits. Your eyes will tell you if you're having an effect, but don't, I'm not at all saying get rid of the skimmer and turn it off the system. So John says, with Chato and his refugium, should he be trimming it back and removing it some of it once it grows thick? Absolutely, John. That's the name Absolutely. of the game. Yes. You can export the client's tank here that has a refugium. I mean, it grows thick. I get a five-gallon bucket of thick Chato and Clorpa out of this thing every two weeks. Like, I can just pick it up. It's like a mat. Uh, it's so thick. And if I let that go thick for over the two to three weeks, the nutrients will start rising again because the algae isn't growing. As soon as I harvest it, and when I do harvest it, I take like 85% of the algae out. Then it has a chance to grow. I can watch those nutrients drop again. It's a fun little experiment. But yeah, once your refugium uh, starts to grow in, it's getting covered. You got to harvest it. You got to get it out of your tank. Here's a hint. A great way to make reefer friends is to give it to someone. Uh, if you want to sell it, you can too. It's actually in hot demand right now uh, for... Uh, whether yeah, it's Chato or Calerpa for your refugium. So let's flip over to a live question, uh, Dr. Tim. These are, I enjoy the text ones and the live ones all alike. So Jeff D, uh, fire away, Jeff, you're live. Hello there. All right, so listening to you talk about the beneficial bacteria is super intriguing, super exciting. How does that coincide when you are running a UV sterilizer? And is that because that UV sterilizer by nature is going to be killing bacteria, but you're putting in beneficial bacteria? What are your guys' thoughts on that? I'll start with you, Dr. Tim. Well, I'm not a big fan of UV sterilizers. That's in a reef tank, yeah, for sure. If you if you have a fish tank, I can see the benefit uh it's kind of some insurance but you just have to understand that it is going to kill the beneficial bacteria and if you have a uv sterilizer and you're having nuisance outbreaks what you really need to do is get a reactor and use some type of a bio pellet because the bacteria are going to be growing on the bio pellet and 
getting rid of the nutrients and until the bio pellets uh, biomass gets so big that it goes into the water, then the UV will kill it, but you don't care at that time because they're growing on the, uh, the bio pellets. This happens a lot in uh, doctor's offices or display uh, tanks like at the Las Vegas airport where the lights are on 24 hours a day um, and they just can't get rid of these nutrients or, and so they've got lots of algae, put in some type of a bioreactor with bio pellets and your UV, you can still run it 24 hours a day. Uh, depending on your v UV also, you're not sure if you don't clean the tube, the quartz tube a lot and change the lamp, uh, you're not sure how effective it's gonna be. So that's UV is something that I've started using on builds, but I use it in specific reasons. Mainly I use it on builds where I have a larger tank really in length, and I'm going to be knowing in the client that it's going to be looking down a long area of water. For example, peninsula tanks. If you look down a peninsula tank, 8, 10, 12 foot long tank, unless the water is perfectly clear, it's going to look a little cloudy, which to me isn't bad. Dr. Tim and I kind of like that because that means there's stuff in the water. But, you know, a lot of people are like, this tank should be absolutely sparkly clean. I should see nothing when I look down the tank. That's when I'll use the UV, but I still don't like to run the UV 24-7. Uh, I'll cycle it on a couple hours a day. Um, but that's really the only time I use it. On another hand, I don't like to use it as a way to deal with fish diseases. Uh, if you're relying on UV to deal with fish diseases, to me, that's like just, yeah, it's too late and you're not really dealing with the core of the problem. So a uh, good question about the UV, Jeff. Uh, let's drop down and see if anyone's down there at the bottom of the outfit. All right, Wesley B, you're unmuted, Wesley. Have at it. Hey, Mark. Um, this Dr. Tim he sounded like he answered this for me a little bit. I have some 100-gallon um, tank. It's about four months old. Um, I have all sorts of problems lately. I've been trying to grow coral, SPS. Um, I have a couple softies in there. They've been dying and been getting some algae. Um, red, some green. So I got some cleanup crew in there. Uh, and I've been thinking about getting a bio pellet reactor. My phosphates are high, my nitrates are high. I have a small fuge. I don't think that's really doing anything. Um, I can't really grow any co copepods or anything like that. So it's kind of, is that, I don't really have a direction. I'm kind of thinking of going the bio pellet reactor way. Would you say your phosphates and nitrates are high? I mean, what 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 values are you talking? He muted himself. I'll give him just a second here. There oh, you go. There you go. Yep. Um, twenty fifty plus on the it's on the Red Sea. It's you know on the dark red. Okay. But and the phosphates are I think they were like sixteen. It's hard to read, but they're on the higher end as well. Are you what are you are you feeding a lot? I mean, or what's in this no, tank? Two cubes a day. And, do you have a lot of fish? Yeah, about eleven fish. Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you <laughs> kind of got to decide small, whether you small, want a coral tank or a fish tank. <laughs> I mean, those yeah. night you said fifty. I'm like, I haven't seen fifty on a test kit for nitrates and. I don't know how long, even my client's tank, when he feeds, I swear this guy feeds like an eighth of a pack a day for uh, five tanks that he has in his tank. So, uh, yeah, so def definitely the bio pellets. I mean, just like I mentioned with these bigger tanks with fish loads, the bio pellets, what you want to do, because that'll grow lots of bacteria. It'll consume those nutrients. It takes, you know, a couple of weeks to get it going. Um, and then assume you have a skimmer that will take. So what's happening is the bacteria are growing on the bio pellet, consuming the nutrients. When the biomass on the bio pellets gets big enough because they're tumbling in there, the biomass breaks off, goes into the water, and then your skimmer will remove that biomass, removing the nutrients. So that's definitely the way to go with that. So Wesley, one thing about bio pellets is they were very popular oh, five to six years ago, and a lot of reefers tried them. Um, some people didn't like them because they said it killed their corals. What I found with this is that's people that went all in on bio pellets and said, 
two cups and they dumped in the two cups immediately and then it stripped down the tank's water very quickly, that's when you have problems. So you have a lot of nutrients. You also want to grow corals. You mentioned softies. Go slow on the bio pellets. You're really giving them a lot to go with right away because you have those nutrients, but start with quarter or a half dose. Get it going. As Dr. Sim said, it's going to take a couple weeks to get it going. Don't go with the full recommended dose from the get-go. Go a little bit, see what you get, build it up, get comfortable with it, and then add more if you need it, especially on a, on a big nutrient tank uh, like that. Yeah, right. make sure you've got some way to remove lots of the organics in the system, frequent cleanings or something like that, because with that amount of food, you're going to have a lot of organic buildup you need to get out. And one thing that's key with bio pellets is it's a good skimmer is a must. You're not going to have that effective with bio pellets by just doing a water change, even a big water change once a week. You simply need that 24-7 or 27 uh, nutrient export to really make those things kick and uh, really do their job. And if you are doing the bio pellet route, don't be surprised. If you have a refugium, if you see your refugium start to go away, you kind of got to pick which camp you're going to be in. I love bio pellets. I love carbon dosing. Uh, my 90-gallon tank was a carbon dose tank. I just love what it does for the tanks. I'm not afraid of it at all. All right, Tim L, let's take a live question, then we'll take a text question. Have at it, Tim. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Yep. So I got a question about brown algae, but uh, quick question first, uh, Zeobit uh, system, the Zeo, uh, pellet, Zeolith stones, does that count as a bio pellet reactor or no? That's not my question, but you just made me think of it. No, I mean, that okay. that's good. clean up till light. It's, it's, a, it's a clay Some that's not Cool. Okay, yep. that's, that's what I thought. So my question is about brown algae. So I've had a tank two years, uh, 100, it's, a, it's a six foot water box, 230.6, uh, got a healthy refugium, lots of SPS, corals growing, going great, growing great, everything's growing great. I have a decent fish load, uh, five anthias, a couple of small tangs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, nutrients, uh, nitrates five to 10, nitrates maybe 38 parts per billion, phosphates about 0.1. Uh, but once a week, and, and when I first started the tank, I had tons of diatoms. I checked silicates, they were always zero, never got it to read on any of the uh, the test kits I could buy. Bought a couple of different kinds, wasn't sure they were legit or not. Uh, sent a couple of uh, of the test kits off to, you know, the uh, ICP test. Uh, silicates were fine. At any rate, uh, I still get this, not as much as I had in the beginning, but still once a week, I got to scrape my in, inner tank uh, glass of this brown uh, algae. It's not a slime algae, it's not the, di it's not the dinos. It's, uh, it's kind of like a, uh, it's almost like powdery when it comes off, but it does come off with a regular, you know, one of those magnetic scrapers I got from Saltwater Aquarium, but still, it just seemed to be a pain, or maybe everyone has to do that every week, I don't know. Is it this stuff just on the glass, Tim, or is it on yeah. the rocks? No, it doesn't appear to be on the rocks. The rocks have good growth of coralline. I mean, heck, I put a, you know, I put my dry, my wet side uh, uh, MP40s in, uh, the, every week take the old ones out they're covered in coralline within a week or two and so i mean that's growing well it's growing on all the rocks the live rock you got pretty good uh, dose of live rock in there not a i don't have a thick sand bed maybe a uh maybe an inch in some areas less uh less than that um and like i said everything seems to be well and healthy and i guess it's not a huge deal to clean the inner tank glass every week but it does get to be a pain in the butt i do have an automatic water change i use chopping marin uh, reef salt uh, that uh, it changed out three and a half gallons every night. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure actually what's going on. So some of that, I mean, it's relative. Like I have clients who clean, have to clean their glass once a week and they're fine with it. And some people like to clean the glass, some people don't. And it's not uncommon to me to see the brown powdery fuzzy looking stuff on the tank's glass. I mean, to me, that means there's I kind of got everything in, in a balance to me. There's stuff growing in there. Um, so to me, it doesn't bother me. If you're looking for something that's, you clean it, have to clean it less than once a week, then maybe more of a bio pellet type of thing. Uh, I'll let Dr. Tim answer as well. But to me, that's not a bad thing that you have to scrape it down. No, but, but I mean, if, if you want to try to eliminate it, actually, Mark is showing the gels and uh, the waste away gels. And that is a slow time release of bacteria. So 24-7, it is releasing a little bit of bacteria. And we have a lot of stores that use this in the commercial form, which is a big one-pound tub 
Um, and what they find is they don't have to clean the glass nearly as often because that's a bacterial film, a little bit of slime and bacteria that's in there. And that's why you see all the copepods and everybody else picking at it because that's their food. Um, but this might help uh, by using a constant dosing of a little bit of bacteria, or if you have a dosing system, you can dose a little bit of bacteria into the system on a regular basis, you can try that instead of the gels. But that's what we found with these gels is, um, you'll keep your glass a lot cleaner. Now, Dr. Tim, this sits for 60 gallons. I have a 120 gallon tank. I just have to use two of these? Uh, that's the medium. There's a large. Okay. Yeah, so it's different sizes. Okay. Um, but if we need it in multiple, is it okay to add two to three at a time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Great question. All right. So, Mary, a lady reefer question here. She's going to wrap us up for tonight, Mary. She wants to know, is it better to use biopellets uh, than ROA FOSS in a reactor? Dr. Tim, I'll let you start with that, uh, and I'll throw in my two cents if needed. Well, they, they're doing the same thing. It just, well, they're not doing the same thing. Biopellets are gonna remove nitrates and phosphate. ROA FOSS is only gonna remove phosphate. So it depends on what you what your system needs, and also depends on how much time that you have to interact with it because the row of FOSS has to be clean just like the bio pellets have to be um, put in a reactor and they have to be replenished. So there's no one right answer. Me, I would go with bio pellets because they consume both nitrates and phosphate um, instead of just eliminating phosphate because then you're gonna play pretty much right into the dinos if it gets too low, um, but that's personal preference. Hope that answers your question. Mark can finish up. Yeah, it's just, that's one of those things where I love these kind of either or questions. Like, I understand that's how the human mind works, but like running bio pellets or running ROA, like I'm using different things for different reasons. Um, I like running ROA or GFO in a tank when the tank needs it. This is where I'm listening to the tank. It's going to tell me what I want and then I'm going to give it. Both of those I don't have a problem with, but if I'm dealing with more of a nutrient issue, or I just like the idea of bio pellets, I'm gonna go that route, but keep in mind if you're doing bio pellets, you have no nitrates, no phosphates on your test kits, you're probably not gonna get that much out of them. Um, right. You know, row of phosphates is a quick, you can put row in there, you can drop your nitrate or your phosphates really quickly, which can cause issues in your tank. So they each have their own. Also keep in mind that a reactor that you're gonna run row of phosphates in is not the same reactor that you're gonna run bio pellets in. You can't just take your bio pellets and chunk it in a uh, a phosphate or flowdized media reactor, it's not going to be effective. The bio pellets have that film that Dr. Tim talked about. It'll gum up those sponges in those normal fluidized media reactors, things that you would put the ROA in. So you want to make sure you get a bio pellet reactor as opposed to a media reactor because they're two different things to let those bio pellets do uh, what they need to do for you. Great question, though. These, uh, you all had some great questions tonight. Uh, we've been kicking on this thing for an hour and 15. Thanks, Doc, for your time on a Sunday evening. Thanks, Thanks everyone. For me. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's uh, good to see you virtually since uh, I can't see you at a trade show. We certainly can't get together to do another video, uh, but soon. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being with us and uh, being on a Sunday night. We'll be back next Sunday night to talk about fish disease uh, and prevention on that one as well. Have a great rest of your week. For those of you that are coming out of lockdowns, uh, wear the face mask, wash your hands, stay safe. We're all on this thing together. Enjoy your tanks, grow some bacteria, grow some algae. Uh, and remember, it's just not all about zeros. Do what the tank needs, give it what it wants, listen to it. At the end of the day, have some fun. We got into this hobby to have a good time. Thanks everyone. Have a great Sunday night. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Tim.